course, I, I spoke about the intentionality of microtones. If you play a microtone intentionally, it has a power. If you play it unintentionally, it sounds out of tune. Same thing with the when of playing that you have to pick that moment very intentionally and then it has some power. In addition, the way we stretch that line out to postpone the resolution is by making the, mo the melody convoluted. We fractalize that line, right? And we do it by making the phrases asymmetrical. So by introducing an asymmetry, we have to then balance it out. In the balancing, we introduce another asymmetry and then balance that one. And as we go down, and we start, start to, you know, we, we approach resolution. We have to smooth all those imbalances out, coincidentally with the last moment of the last note in the line. So, what, would you like me to demonstrate that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to play a classical piece of music here, which is not highly improvised, but like all, all Mugams, it has room for, uh, the word improvisation comes from jazz, so it's, it, I don't want to mislead anybody. This is not jazz, but it is theme and variation, and the best way to characterize this kind of improvisatory uh, uh, um, approach to this kind of music is to say that there's a classic skeletal version of it, and then there's the musician who personalizes his or her version of it. And so in that, in that case, so, so uh, someone who's, um, uh, what, what's the word, a connoisseur, someone a, a cognoscente of Mugam, the first three notes is, oh, I know which Mugam you're playing. The next three notes, you should know who's playing it, right? Because it's, oh, that's so-and-so doing that bugam, right? Okay.
Yeah. Any questions, please? <laughs> yes, sir. I have a question. In the culture of Azerbaijan, is there a defined uh, philosophy of music as you have in China and, and in other cultures that, say, music purifies the soul or elevates it or takes it on a journey? Because there is no rhythm. There can't be ecstasy, right? There's not this kind of ecstatic rhythmic effect that you have in other music and cultures. But what is it? Has, has it been defined? Is there is there a, a general considered a purpose of music? Yes. The scholars, that's what they do. <laughs> they write books about the ecstatic experience of uh, playing and listening to Mugam. They wrote extensively about it. So is there a consensus in, in what, what the effect is supposed Probably to be? Probably just or? as much consensus about what Mugam is as there is in any other topic that people can't achieve a consensus on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's going to be there's going to be certain grounds for for um, there'll be some grounds for agreement and other grounds for non-agreement. Um, so, you know, uh, it would be easier to answer your question if you if you were to ask ask me what my opinion was of certain things, then I could give you a definitive answer. I wouldn't have to be so vague. Because it's the the question you asked is about the broadest angle question. You know, of course, there's a there's a there's a pedagogy. They teach this music, and there's a philosophy. There, you know, those who those who uh, want to think and write about it, you know, they, of course, they have that as well. Um, were you, would you like to hear what what I think about yeah. it? Okay, basically, there's like all um, human in, endeavors, there's a spectrum, right, from one end to the other. So at one end is uh, this you know, pursuit of a pure mystical experience. On the other end would be something which would be more uh, performance oriented and, and, uh, and, or academic, right? where, um, where one wants to uh, be more uh, crisply defined about everything. And those who are seeking a mystical experience, it, it kind of, you know, in other words, if you, if you play this phrase like this, right, or you play it, Can we get? Can people get into a heated discussion about that? Yes, I actually saw two men come near to blows in uh, the Park Inn Hotel in Baku, right by, the, right on the boulevard. Uh, that same year, I performed at the Art Garden. There was this seven-day seminar, and uh, one fellow was a musician who played this instrument, and he said his frets were, were pleased him. Another fellow was an academician who was insisting that, you know, the frets have to be in a certain place. But he doesn't play, right? He just records what someone else did. So, and, and right in front of me, they got into such a thing about, you know, what microtone was correct, uh, they, we had to separate them. That's how heated up people get about these things. Uh, so, that, because you asked about consensus, right? That was, I think you used the word consensus. Yeah. 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 So, difficult. It's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult. If you leave your if you leave your email address, I can send you a bunch of links, Jeffrey's picks mm -hmm. of the stuff that I listen to. And if I don't send it to you, I don't listen to it. Yeah. Another question I have is about the role of silence. Uh, clearly, in Western music, silence, prolonged silence, is not really an option. And normally, after a piece of music is played, immediately the audience responds by applauding, and so getting this, this moment of, or this prolonged moment of, of silence out of the way. Right. It, it, has it been defined, like, no. what silence is meant to be, uh, how long it should be? No. Yeah. No, that's, that's uh, I, I, to the best of my knowledge, I'm the only one who does that. Did you notice I didn't ask anybody not to clap? How did everybody just know not to clap? <laughs> I've been doing this for such a long time. One time I was in San Francisco, there was, there was a, crowd of 300 people, which is an enormous crowd for this kind of music. And uh, it was a church and it was packed. It wasn't a I wasn't the draw. It was uh, uh, Hamza Eldin, who passed away since then. He passed away shortly after, the, after that, that day. And we shared the programming. Uh, and I thought to myself, how am I going to get these people to feel that they, you know, the silence at the end is at least as juicy and wonderful as the, as the performance itself. And I thought, well, I know what to do. I'll just stretch out the pauses between phrases gradually so that by the time it gets to the end of the piece, you know, it'll just seem like just another pause, right? And I would, I would just 
do like I wouldn't move, you know. And by the time they figured out the piece was over, it was too late. The silence had settled in, and they got it. So I didn't have to. The, the second and third piece, everything went swimmingly well, uh, up until the moment I got up out of my chair, and then, you know, they did that thunderous sound, which is. It's really, I, I can't imagine anyone appreciating that sound because if they knew what the origins of it was, no one would do it. It comes from uh, the medieval torture times where people would be publicly dis disemboweled and they would clap to drown out the sounds of the screams. And we've heard a lot of things uh, that people clap at which are absolutely atrocious. You know, so t the sound of applause doesn't mean anything to me. What means something to me is while I'm immersed in the, in, the, in the journey, I can feel who's coming with me. And that's all I want. Right? But nobody's written about that yet. <laughs> yes, yes ma'am. I have two questions. Let's start with one. Could you tell us about the importance of the text, or the world, of the stories, which are also uh, told by Mugam? Because I know that a lot of Mugam players also sing. Could yes. You tell us well, primarily that? Mugam is a vocal tradition. Mm -hmm. Instrumental Mugam, uh, uh, basically the instruments are used to accompany a singer. Now, there is a parallel tradition of instrumental solo mugam, and that's, that's what I'm doing. Mugam is a vocal uh, performance. Of course, it's more like opera, and the words are antiquated. They come from an, an old form of the Azerbaijani language, and even those who speak Az fluent Azerbaijani often have difficulty with the words. It's like sort of asking, asking us to sh recite Shakespearean English. So, uh, so of course the words have meaning. They're usually they're ghazals. And uh, I think there's uh, the Persians, Afghanis, Pakistanis, and North Indian uh, traditions also have Ghazal, and the, you know, the Persian Empire, the so-called Mughal dynasty, that spread all the way across uh, to North India. So the tradition of singing Ghazal as the poetic content for the exposition of the Mughal is is standard procedure there. Uh, the meaning of the words is that they it ranges from the uh, you know absolutely pedantic you know ordinary romantic sort of uh, allusions to, you know, exalted mystical states. And, you know, anytime anyone speaks about the meaning of the word love, and there's many, many words for that word in the Azerbaijani language, which come from Persian and Arabic as well, as the Turkish dialect. Uh, so there's many shades and, and, and uh, contexts for the, the experience of love. Uh, it's always considered a metaphor for, for the love of some higher power. Uh, that, you know, or if you drink wine, uh, that that sense of being intoxicated, is your your uh, shul is being carried to another world. And the second question is about thank you very much, but the regional differences because again uh, in Azerbaijan people say you know, oh it's Karabakh or oh, it is southern Azerbaijan. What are the differences in the same Mugam? Would you, for example, recognize whether it is uh, the variation? Yes, the yes. Problem? There's a lot of talk about that. They talk mm -hmm. about the. The Karabakh school, the Baku school, and the, the Shemachi school, things like that. Uh, the differences between them are basically inscrutable and, and subject, a subject worthy of the study of the most pedantic scholar you can imagine. The, 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 pur the purpose of this music, doesn't matter if it's from Morocco to Indonesia, all across that arc, the purpose is transcendence, right? Let me help by giving you what I think transcendence means based on my experience of this kind of music, which is, you know, we all have a mind, and it works. The proof is we're all here in this room, because if our mind didn't work, we wouldn't have survived. So the survival mind, is, which is the boss of the whole uh, business up in the head for calculating and measuring and predicting, <coughs> that's the ordinary mind. And the ordinary mind, in order to do its job, cannot be so relaxed that it loses its vigilance because then you get run over by a car or you fail your exam or you disappoint your boss or your spouse or whatever, you, you spoil things in your life. So we have to pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. That's the ordinary, everyday, mundane mind. Then we have this thing called the transcendent mind which is we forget all about our cares, all of a sudden we feel transported to another realm and there's no labeling that realm because it's mystical. It's better left unlabeled, uh, and 
there's all kinds of ideas about how to get from the ordinary, mundane, you know, vigilant lookout for yourself mind to this blissful state of a transcendence. I believe that the origins of this music are one such legitimate road from the anxiety-ridden mentality we ordinarily live with and are accustomed to into this extraordinary realm. Is it the only way? Of course not. You know, we have transcendental meditation, we have whirling dervishes, we have 101 different mystical <coughs> techniques. Um, I, I like this one. <laughs> this, this, you know, this one lends itself well to the shape of me. So that's why I, you know, uh, I, you know, I checked all these things in Tai Chi. I did it all, and I, th you know, vipassana, vipassana, or however you pronounce it, meditation with mindfulness, great stuff. But well, I think music beats them all. I really do. And Azerbaijani music, in particular, is a particularly potent version of this. Why? Because the ancient knowledge of transcendental states of mind and how to achieve them through the science of sound was something that was invented alongside of the, the same uh, <coughs> sophisticated technology that built the pyramids of Egypt. So 4,500 years ago, people evolved to the point where they understood how to instantly a a achieve a very stable form of transcendence. Actually, not just had to touch it once a week, but to deeply immerse and live in it on a constant basis. This was their goal. And they found that music had the power to create transcendental states of mind. So the origin of the structure of Mugam and all the music in North Africa, from Morocco to Egypt, all the <coughs> Mesopotamia, Central Asia, Turkish, you know, the Anatolia, all the way to Indonesia, is based on this kind of trance-inducing structure of, of music. Okay, fine. So, uh, but when that concept, it's an esoteric concept, emerged out of Egypt, and it came, it came out through several, several uh, paths, when they worked their way through the to the different regions, there was already a living culture present that this esoteric concept inseminated with this powerful concept. So each local zone has its own local version of that grand idea. That's what that makes them, that's why there's something in common with all of them, and it's also why they're all different, because they had their own indigenous native culture there. What was in the Caucasus when the idea of makam, as the Arabs pronounce it, or makum, as the as the Hebrews, ancient Hebrews pronounce it, Mugam, as the Azerbaijanis pronounce it. What was there when the idea came? And it was the great ancient tradition of music called Ashik. And Ashik music is about as powerful a music as I've ever heard. It makes your hair stand on your arms. It's unbelievable force that these people are singing relatively simple melodies, but they're singing with such force, such presence, that it's, it's electrifying. So Mugam has the advantage of the esoteric concept from Egypt and the local shamanistic tradition, which originally probably came from Central Asia, you know, somehow made it to the Caucasus. That's, that's our guess. At, at the Asha. So, so Makam plus Asha gives us Azerbaijani Mugam. Was that a comprehensive answer? <laughs> you already asked two, so I'm going to come back to you. Is that all right? Is that fair? Yeah. Okay, we're it's a democratic a little bit. Yes, please. Could you tell us a little bit more about the social moments where music is played? Which Today. Can, yeah, social Today. gathering, yes. weddings, funerals. Yes, it, it, of course, in Baku, it's basically a performance thing. It's staged, right? In the villages, it's more oriented towards weddings and similar you know, events. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it, has, it, it plays more of a, so, a role in... in the, uh, the socialization of society, the integration of the individual into a group, Mugam and, and, and the related musics play a role. In the capital, it's mostly it's performance art. You know, it's staged, it's performance It's wonderful, but it's, it's not the same. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not, you'll not find much Mugam in, in, a, in a modern Azerbaijani wedding. Yeah. Shakira, yes. <laughs> Mugam, no. <laughs> Or Rihanna, who was just there? I forgot. It was J Lo and Rihanna. It's the crazy stuff. Uh, there was another question I felt. No, someone asked. I felt something. No. 